we're doing uh, the four questions about end times, and that is what we're doing. And so we're breaking this down, and this part will even continue next week and get into this. But we're doing four, uh, four questions about end times, and so we have two left after this. But the big question that we're trying to answer right now is how do we know that we're living in end times? And I, I think that's important because, of, like I said before, when it comes to this subject, we've been saying that for years, that we're living in end times. You know, you know what I'm saying? Even the disciples were asking, Lord, how do we know that this is the end? Or how do we know that this, uh, the end is coming? And so it's important for us to understand. But I wanted to give principles as we go through this that kind of paint the big picture. All right? I want to paint the big picture. And that big picture that we're trying to figure out with this is we're trying to see what are the principles of why Jesus is coming back? What are the principles of the things that we're looking for? Because there's been things where people are talking about signs in the sun and the color of the sun and, you know, just different things like that when we have the, the red uh, moon and things like that. And I know that the Bible speaks about those things. But then sometimes we get so confused in talking about those details that we don't get into some of the broader things that the Bible talks about. So the Bible describes a couple of illustrations about the coming of Christ. One was in the days of Noah, and one is in the days of Lot. And then if you've been part of our study, you've seen how there's a few of those things that we've kind of pulled together understanding this. And the Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so also is the coming of the Son of Man be. So what was the days of Noah? The Bible says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great. That, that's important for us to understand, and I'm kind of recapping a little bit from last week. The Bible is very clear that when we see wickedness growing in, in the, the fact that it would happen in the days of Lot, we have that description, we have that in the days of Noah, we have that description. And, but it says that the, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Man was created to bring glory to God. This world was created to bring glory to God. When man stops bringing glory to God, then we stop to have our purpose in life. The church was created to reach people and bring glory to God. And you think about that. When we think about that in light of what Revelation talks about, when he talked about that candle and he said, I'll pull that candle out. Literally, you cease to accomplish the job that I've given you. And it says when man gets to the point where nothing is about God, and I know man struggles it's a matter of, you know, with our money. I struggle with my money and putting God first and things like that. But when it says every imagination, literally when it comes to morality, when it comes to government, when it comes to uh, marriage, when it comes to raising kids, when it comes to everything, everything that they do has nothing to do with God. And that's what this was talking about. Even in the, in the Bible, when it talks in Genesis 18:20, when it talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, it says the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great. It was talking about there was no longer a secret. It was, it was one, th- one thing when they talked about how there's shame. And when there's shame, you hide it. You know, when, when kids do something wrong and they know that they're doing something wrong, they hide it. When, when Morgan was a little girl, she, she took this candy bar and she stuck it behind her back. And I said, after dinner, and she snuck it behind her back and like walked out of the room backwards like that. You say, why did she do that? Because she knew she was doing wrong. Society doesn't do that anymore. Society now looks out there and we, we, have, we, we call it pride. We're, we're proud of the sin that we have. It's no longer shame because the scales have tipped the other way. There's way more that are doing one thing than doing righteousness when it comes to this. Matthew 24, 12, and it says, because iniquity shall abound. Iniquity is what he was talking about. It's going to abound. It's going to excel. It's going to increase. If you've been part of this, that word abound means to multiply. We talk about how do we know we're living in the end times. If you were part of this study, we know that we're living in the end times because it talks about, even in Daniel 12, about uh, knowledge shall be increased. There'll be an abundance of it. Man, there's a lot of good. Let me tell you guys, there's a lot of good that comes from technology. Right now, right, we have an audience of people tuning in to watch what, this Bible study. The technology can be good, but let me tell you, Satan's always going to look for an advantage to do bad with it. Always. That's why we were talking about the statistics last week about how do we know we're living in the last days because we live in days of multiplied sin. We do. We live in the days of multiplied sin. I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm saying it's escalated, and I'm not going to go into the details, but last week... We sat for probably 10 minutes of the Bible study and we just gave out stats, not of things that have just increased. I'm not talking about things of our culture, but because of technology, they have spiked like, like, like five and six and a thousand times what they were before. Not, not even comparable to what it was before. 
And the internet pornography, internet child trafficking, child pornography, when it comes to cheating on people, when it comes to stirring up strife, when it comes to all those things, technology has exploded those things in our culture. But the next thing is, how do we know we're living in the last days? The second part of this, and this is where we stopped last week, is the fact that we live in the days of the great falling away. I'm going to spend the entire evening talking about this. We live in the day of the great falling away. And I know the Bible prophesied of that, and the Bible taught that that's part of what's going to happen, because the Bible says in that verse, Matthew 24, verse 12, and because, and because, because what? What, 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 is, what is the reason that he's coming when he was teaching in this? Because iniquity shall abound. We've got that part. But he said, but because the love of many shall wax cold. Now, let's just break that down. And I know this is not new for a lot of people. The love is talking about God's love or love towards God's or love towards one another. And he literally was saying for this, you're going to know that there's going to be sign of something, that there's going to be something that it should be powerful in our culture and it's not going to be powerful anymore. It's going to grow cold. The wax cold that it's talking about is meaning that it just loses its power. Not that God's power is lost, but I'm telling you, where to light our light so shine? If we put a bushel over it, bad attitudes or whatever we do, we hinder the spirit and the working of the spirit of God. And I asked you, why does this happen? And we're going to dig deep into this as we go into this. And I'm going to give you guys a lot of, if you guys noticed even last week, it wasn't just verses that we were giving, but the statistics in our culture that back up those verses. See, with all that God has blessed us with, why would we be people that would fall away? Think about it. I mean, think, man, God's been good. God's not stopped being good. God has been amazing. So the question is, with all the good that God has done, why in the world would there be a great falling away? Because God has still been good to them and he's been good to us. Because I think both of these things have to do with each other. Because iniquity shall abound. The love of many shall wax worse. And, and because Christians get caught up in the world, it's easy to do. You think about this. The more the blessings come, the more we get distracted. It's just human nature. Think about this verse in relation to this, Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, I know we talk about that verse when it comes to discipleship and things like that. But it says, be not conformed to the world. Who is it talking to when it comes to that? Be not conformed to the world. That's talking about Christians. Saying Christians, as iniquity shall abound and, and things are going to get bad, it's easy for Christians to adapt to the culture around us. It's easy for us just to accept it, especially when you're watching sitcoms and TV and, and show after show, and all of a sudden you see it so much, but you, you fall in love with the characters and you start laughing at these things. And all of a sudden, the things that one time you stood for, uh, up against and said, man, that's just wrong. Now, now it's entertainment. You say, how does that happen? Because one thing, it's all around us. And he says, you have to be careful not to conform to this world because that's what happens without it, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Which work that verse in reverse. If you are not, if you are being conformed to the world, that means that you are not proving what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Tell me, what happens in a culture when there is no voice of truth? What happened in a culture when they started falling away and, and God had to send in a prophet to rise up because they weren't getting it anywhere else. I'm going to ask you guys in our culture today, everybody online, as you're listening to this, how is the world getting truth today? Where is the world getting truth today? Is there truth today? I mean, outside of the word of God, you, you look across our society and our culture and you're thinking, where are they? Is it even present? Is it even out there? And, and you say, why is it like this? Because we have adapted to the world. We have adapted to their purpose. Even Christians, it's easy for us to adapt to materialism and morals and the standards of the world. When the Bible says, let our light shine, it's not shining anymore because the love of Christ is not coming out of us like that, like it once was. We get busy. And this is the world's way of getting busy. And then all of a sudden, church gets put on the back burner. And I've said this so many times before. When church gets put on the back burner and all of a sudden, we're not following the program and the teaching that God has given us, what happens to the next generation? We're already seeing it. There's no shock to anybody right now. The next generation, when what, what one generation tolerates, the next generation will practice. That's just the way that it is. We're experiencing this. 
We raise our kids to grow up in church as an option, and then they choose that option of I'd rather be in, uh, stay in bed when, it, when they get older. And the more the church steps back, the less Christians speak up, the louder Satan's voice becomes, and the pendulum begins to swing, or the, the weights, the scales begin to swing the other way. We see this. That's why the Bible things said things will grow worse and worse. That's why the Bible said perilous times will come. Because all of a sudden, there's going to be great falling away. And I think it happens from us, just, just us adapting to the world around us. And I think that happens because it shoved, it's so easy. You, you go from Netflix to the movies to Facebook to entertainment to video games to PlayStation to, you, you guys know what I'm saying? It's just every aspect of our world is a distraction. And it's technology. And I'm, once again, I'm not, I hate technology. But I'm just saying Technology is in our pocket, in our laps, on our walls, in our offices, in our cars. It's all around us. So it can be shoved in our face so much that it's easy to listen and do everything other than what we're supposed to. So this is a big sign of the Lord's return. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a a, a falling away first. That the man of sin shall be revealed in the sign of perdition. Literally, the Bible says that there's going to, before he comes, this is a big sign. He said, there's going to be a falling away. And you think about what that means, a falling away, a coming away, a stepping away from the things that we know that is right. And you say, why is this? Why would God wait to come till there's this great falling away? You think about it, because the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us. Literally mean, God has patience with us. God has patience with our world. I'm going gonna, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna to end this lesson with this today. God shows so much mercy to us that it, is, it blows our mind, that, that word long-suffering. When, when people say the words like this, it says, if God doesn't do something to America, he'd have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. I hate that phrase because God doesn't have to apologize to nobody, okay? God doesn't apologize to nobody. But the idea of it is the fact that we just think that, man, how much more is God going to tolerate when he sees this? Every day that God doesn't come back, it's a matter of God, there's, there's still a system. There's still people teaching and preaching for the hope that somebody will come to know Christ because he is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. When that time comes and the light dims out and there's no more preaching and there's no more, rev- and I don't even mean no more, but I mean it's died out as the program of it that changes things. The heart of Jesus is for mankind and society and the churches to glorify him. So I'm going to ask you two quick big questions with this. Are we seeing a great falling away? Are we seeing a great falling away? Have you ever noticed when it comes to your kids, you don't notice how much they grow because you're with them every single day? Then you'll go to a relative's house or something like that, and they'll go, oh my goodness, what happened to you? you know, it, it just blows your mind when you don't see somebody for a while how, how much they change and how much they grow and things like that. And it's just, uh, I was talking to the Taylors this past Sunday. We were talking about our kids, and I was telling them about, uh, they were talking about how much the boys have grown, and I was talking about how much my boys would grow in five, six inches in one year, just th- those growths. And I think sometimes with us as a culture, because we're around it, we don't see how bad things have gotten. We see it constantly so much that I think we kind of adapt to it so we don't see the big picture of it. Can I do a history lesson with you guys? I mean, like I said, I, just, I think it's important that we do like step back and we kind of see, have we gone to falling away? Because you'd have to see where we were to know if we've fallen away from something. You know what I'm saying? So let's look at this. Let me just take the last 200, 250 years. And I, in light of 6,000 years of the earth, that's not a lot of time. But let's just, let's just take that. And I started thinking about just what we have in our culture in America and in, 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 uh, England and in, in that relationship there is starting with like Harvard University. The school was highly religious in the 1600s. Harvard uh, rules and their precepts declared, and they said this, they said, let every student be plainly instructed to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, John 17, 3. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, today we're talking about the most liberal but I'm saying how, where it once was. We, we need to go back a little bit and see where this once was. Among the graduates, we're talking about Harvard University, but among the graduates that were in that century, 50% of them were pastors and ministers. 50% of them. Prior to uh, the revolution, 10 out of 12 of the Harvard's uh, uh, presidents were also ministers. They were pastors. They were preachers. 
Yale started with a pastor. Princeton, for a first year uh, class, was actually taught by a preacher named Jonathan Dickinson. Princeton's crest still says it this day, but it started this way. It said, under God, she flourishes. During this time period, we have people that we uh, kind of don't understand the impact. I, I mean, I can tell you that I don't fully understand the impact that they had. William Carey, the great leader in world missions, translated portions of the scripture into more than 40 languages. One dude, one guy, 40 languages. 102 mission schools opened up with nearly 7,000 students. 102 schools, not converts. Jonathan Edwards, Jonathan Edwards preached sinners in the hands of an angry God. This message was like, open the door for the great awakening. Moving through this history, in July 8, 1741, on this day of history, Jonathan Edwards started a sermon that he did not finish. Such was the impact of his preaching, and I'm quoting this from his biography, that the people listening shrieked and cried out and crying and weeping became so loud that Edwards was forced to discontinue his sermon. Jonathan Edwards walked to a podium. They said he rarely even used hand gestures, held onto the pulpit, pulled out a manuscript, and began to read, Not, not, not talking about itching ears. I'm not talking about he got up with funny stories and illustrations. I'm saying he just began to pour his heart out about the judgment of God on mankind and the judgment of God on sin. It's, it's said during that time that, they would, that, that there was such an impact that the city would show down, shut down, bars would shut down, revivals would literally shut down a city because nobody wanted to be anywhere but other than those places. D.L. Moody, D.L. Moody preached having meetings between 15 and 30,000 people at a time. He preached from nation to nation with overwhelming crowds in attendance. Billy Sunday, moving through history... Billy Sunday is still known as one of the 20th century's best-known evangelists. Over the course of his career, Sunday probably preached to more than 100 million people face-to-face. Majority of that time was out without any amplification. He literally just did it with his booming voice. One modern historian estimated the true figure to be closer to uh, 100 and a quarter million people that were reached from his revivals, reached through his revivals. Sunday estimated that he had preached nearly 20,000 sermons, an average of 42 per month from 1896 to 1935. In 1916, when he was in Baltimore, they, he built a tabernacle called the Salvation Shed. I, I can't even imagine just, just how raw this is, of like the, the description of this. It seated 15,000 people. And 5,000 people extra would stand outside. 5,000 extra people would stand outside just to get close to the service. On the last day, 24,000 people filled the building for time so that Billy preached to about 96,000 people during one day. More than 23,000 people received Christ as a Savior. On the closing night of baseball uh, star home run, Baker and four other New York Yankees were saved during that meeting. In Kansas City, as he traveled, 40,000 people came uh, in the rain to an open service just to stand in the rain to hear him preach. I didn't say 40, 40,000 people. In Pittsburgh, there was only over 26,000 conversions that were recorded at his meeting. Columbus, Ohio, during this time, 18,337 people were saved. In New York, 22,299 people were received of Christ. 22,299. This is what happened almost every time that they went. And I could keep going to Hudson Taylor and on his deathbed, uh, he had uh, reached over 849 uh, more missionaries that went out and did the work of the multiplication of what he did. 250 mission stations. He had 125,000 Chinese converts alone. Churches, colleges, revivals, printing presses, evangelists, missionaries, full speed, Churches were respected. Men of God were leaders in the community. The Bible was used in school, public places, government, prayer was in school. 
that they would, they would talk about revivals that people would line up and take shifts to get in. They talked about revivals that the Spirit of God was working so much that people would pull off to the side of the, uh, side of the streets as they drove past them, get out of their car, and get on their hands and knees and cry out to God for forgiveness. Now this stuff even, this sounds almost like science fiction to us, doesn't it? I mean, just like, okay, that's, that's interesting. And things, when we live in societies, when we try to potlucks and dinners and whatever we can do to try to have a big day at church. And we think that we have a big day because we're up in 10% of attendance or we can say that we've filled the building, whatever. But I'm just saying if we don't understand just what we, what, what we came from, of, of looking back in history a little bit, it, it, things begin to change after World War II. And, and the mission field was open and there was a lot of opportunities and things. But after that, America began to climb out of the Depression. When, when, when blessings begin to come into our life, it's easy to stop looking up. That's just nature, what happens. Because going through trials, it humbles you. You know, you know what I'm saying? There's, there's good things that happen when we go through opposition. I think even COVID-19, it's not all bad. Because it made us step back as Americans and know that we don't have everything figured out. And everything can be turned upside down overnight. See, all these things begin to change. The world was somewhat at peace again. Businesses began to grow, industries, plants, production, all these things, cars and entertainment. America began to get off their knees and go back to work. Money was good, economy was growing, and some of the things that was luxury at one point became everyday part of their lives. Entertainment, eating out, all those kind of things. That became the American dream, the American way that we know it today. This leads to apathy. Remember, we're talking about a great falling away. We're describing, and I'm asking you, have, are we experiencing today a great falling away? Now, first of all, I just want you to think about the statistics, the stories, the history. I'm not talking about Bible days. I'm talking about modern. I, I'm, this leads to apathy. When, when I've used this verse so many times that you guys could quote it. Revelation 3.16, So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, Spew, spew you out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and thou knowest that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. It's, it's just, the great falling away comes from stuff. The great falling away comes from convenience. During the time of the book of Acts, you want to know why the church was flourishing. Every time there was opposition, they would rise up. They would fight back. It's easy when something's handed to you. You don't have to fight for it. It's, it's, you get comfortable. You get used to it. After this, things begin to really fall apart. June 25th, 1962, the U.S. Supreme Court declared that schools no longer would sponsor prayers. They, they had a fancy speech to go with this. I watched it president got up and announced that you can still pray in your home and maybe that's even more important for us as Americans. You don't have to pray in school. We can pray everywhere. That's our American right. Let me tell you, that sounds good. But what it was telling the education of our young people is you don't really need God. You don't need him. What you really need is math and science. You need history. You need that. And don't get me wrong, we do need those things. But America made a decision. Let me remind you of America. One nation under God. I'm not saying that God's not working in other places, but let me tell you, God brought America to a place that we were the senders. We were the educators. We were the printers of the Bible. We were the missionary senders. We, we became a, kind of a hub for Christianity. And I'm, I'm not I'm saying that other places in, in the world were not, but I'm saying we, we, God blessed America in a big way. When you remove God, you remove truth. When you remove truth, what is to follow is a falling away. Falling away from God? Falling away from morals? There's a falling away from truth. Because every man begins to do that which is right in their own eyes. Let me do this again. Let me switch gears. Talk about this. Are we facing a great falling away? I gave you the stats. I gave you the stories. I guess I could say as for what was. Fifteen years before 1963, before prayer was taken out of school, girls ages 15 and 19 years old had no more been 15 pregnant out of 1,000. 
after 1963, pregnancies increased 187% just in the next 15 years. For younger girls, ages 10 to 14, pregnancies since 1963 are up 553%. 553%. And I dare tell you, I have to tell you that these stats are not current. That I could not find, a, I mean, they're, they're current, but they're not current like 2020. Before 1963, sex, sexually transmitted diseases among students were 400 per 1,000 people. Since 1963, they were up 226% in the next 12 years. Before 1963, divorce rates had been declining for 15 years. They'd been declining. After 1963, divorce increased by 300% each year. 300% each year. They went from a decline to an increase of 300% each year for the next 15 years. In 1963, unmarried couples living together went up 353%. Today, today, amongst those same ages, 18 to 24, cohabitating is now more prevalent than people living together as husband and wife. Complete switch. It's not that there's some that now outnumbers those that are married. The Bible says in the days of Noah, one of the things that I didn't really emphasize was in the days of Noah, there was violence. It was a very violent day and age. Since 1963, violent crimes have increased 544%. To the point where now even we have rap artists that literally sing as entertainment the idea of shooting people. The last generation that we had come closest to of any kind of great revivals was Billy Graham of, of the last generation. And uh, the pack out stadiums, go from city to city. A lot of people, uh, I, I've even talked to people in our church that have gone to them and accepted Christ and had their lives changed and things like that. It was a couple of years ago that we lost Billy Graham. That was the last of us hearing of coliseums being filled, revival taking place, the, the whole city turning to listen to the gospel. Have we experienced a great falling away? Yes, we have. We have. If you look over the last five, ten years, you might not be able to see it, but we have. Not just in the world, but in church. From 1990 to 2000, the combined membership of all Protestant denominations in the USA declared almost five million members, while the U.S. population increased by 24 million. There's this chart that displays this and. Over the last 15 years, the drop in church attendance has been twice as great as the decline from the 60s to the 70s. It's not just declining anymore, it's dropping off. It's the same thing as the sin thing. It's like there was the sin that was multiplied. It's the same thing as the decline. The decline, the numbers, the stats are multiplying. The decline of multiplying, it's 600 or 6,000 to 10,000 churches in the U.S., these are current statistics, in the U.S. report dying each year. When I say dying, not going under, decline in attendance, decline in people being added, decline in people being saved, and decline in people being baptized. All their numbers show it's, 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 there's more declining than there is increasing. There was a study put out by Lifeway, a Lifeway Research Group uh, that found that 37,000 or 3,700, excuse me, 3,700 churches close every year. And that was a statistic from five years ago. On average amongst these stats of churches, 40 to 60% of those that claim to attend church are inactive. And if if you were to take the average church role and then say this church runs however many, 40 to 60% of those are inactive, meaning they attend church. This statistic means that they attend church on average of 12 times a year. That's what inactive is. Even that looking at the church today, we have become comfortable and lukewarm. Let me just say this is a challenge to anybody listening. The idea of stepping out on faith. I'm not, when we sit there and say we're okay because we maintain. We maintain. We're not a great falling away because of the fact is we've not adapted to sin. You know, we still see people saved. We still, you know, outreach to the community. That's great. 
it, there's a deeper level to that because I think sometimes Satan can deceive us to think you are okay because of the fact is you're not dying. But the idea that God gave the church was not just the idea of existing, but it was moving forward. It was the idea of multiplying. It was passing it on, sending out missionaries and raising up preachers. In Revelation 3.19, after he talks about them being lukewarm and passive, he says this, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. And the next words are, be zealous. What did he tell them to repent from? Not being zealous. It's, it was never a matter of we show up. We're here. It was a matter of you better be zealous. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. God never called us to maintain. I met with our leadership this last Sunday night and talked about vision and ideas and moving forward. And I said, we have got to be the generation that gets out of the boat. We've got to be the generation. And, and when Peter stepped out of the boat, Jesus called him, invited him to join him in the middle of a storm. He didn't wait for the waters to be calm. He invited him to step out in faith in the middle of a storm. Because God's not just looking for convenience. God is looking for faith. And let me tell you, all the stats that I give you, th these are powerful things because of the fact is that it should stir us up to rise us up, not go, oh man, it's really bad. Here's the last question. We'll close with this. What are the effects of the falling away? The first question is, are we experiencing great falling away? The second thing is, what are the effects of the falling away? The next generation has been indoctrinated with the sins of our culture. Not just surrounded or exposed, indoctrinated. Do you guys hear me? They are indoctrinated. Meaning for a lot of kids growing up, they don't know right and wrong. They don't know it. And, and, I, and I say that as for like if church is the only place they get it. And there's kids in our culture that the large majority of them don't. The generation that's coming behind us don't know what is right and wrong. And for the ones that do go to church, it, it is just we are, we're experiencing kids questioning their faith, questioning whether the gender identity, all these things that the world are, that's easily creeped into the church. And the, the Bible says in 2 Timothy, for the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. Have you ever wondered why that is? But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. You can imagine the churches in our culture today that have adapted to the sins around us. It's, I don't want to be, I don't want to hear that because that, that you, are, you are odd, you are weird, you are, we're, we're a minority. And that's what part of that is, is there's a great falling, war, uh, falling away. What happens to the churches that are left is we become a minority. To stand up and say, Two men being together in a relationship is sin makes us odd. It will not be long. It will not be long before what I just said will be a crime. It will be hate. It will be discrimination. And I'll say, the Bible says it. But the thing is, tearing apart law, tearing apart what is right and wrong, tearing apart anything that defines because people will want to go and hear and be and be around things that make them feel good. Don't tell me I'm doing wrong. But what happens, and the Bible says that they will no longer adhere to sound doctrine, that they would rather go someplace that's going to tell them what they like. So it's going to be easy for a pastor to get up and just say, oh, I'm going to skip that passage, or I'm not going to get on that sin, or I'm not going to address couples cohabitating. I'm not going to address people that are homosexual. I'm not going to address the fact that people are transgender. I'm not going to talk about these things because it's just going to get me in trouble. But let me ask you, and everybody watching right now, if we don't tell them the truth, where are they going to get the truth? If we don't speak up and say, come what may, and the, the, the end times, there's going to be persecution and there's going to be things that are going to upset us. But the Bible just made it very clear that it's going to be easy for churches just to go around those issues because they're going to have people that will not adhere to what is right. 
but it makes us feel good to go to church and it makes us feel good to be in a place that tells me that God loves them and you know blessings will come and, I'm, and all that is true but you cannot get around, around what is right and what is wrong and even in the church there will be a great falling away the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter days some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and the doctrines of devils. I'm going to get into that verse another time because it ties into Revelation chapter 2 and 3 where we're going through on Sunday mornings. I, I, will, I will address that in the Dear Church series. But let me tell you how powerful this is. It says expressly that in the latter days some will depart from the faith. That word faith doesn't mean that necessarily that they give up their faith in God, but the idea of belief in something. It's young people that grew up in church and just say, I'm going to go do my own thing. So faith has different definitions when it comes to things like that. But they give heed to seducing spirits. It's demonic and it's evil and it's wicked. What is going to creep in... And the only thing that we, that the, the hope for this generation is to sit there and say, even there is a falling away. I don't care if our church attendance drops off. I don't care if we're written up in the papers. I don't care. The only hope that they have is preaching truth because the truth is what will set them free. The truth is the only thing that we can deliver to our young people, the next generation, to bring conviction, to convince their heart of what is right and wrong. Rather than arguing with their intellect, that is not our calling. It's just to declare what God has said. Let me tell you what your creator has said works and what does not work. But he says at the same time, we, if we're not spiritually led and spiritually filled and being willing to get out of the boat when it comes to following God, we don't have that faith in God. We're in trouble. Because we're not just dealing with with just people that think differently. We're dealing with seducing spirits that will lead our kids away in a heartbeat and they are doing it as we speak. The laws are changing in our culture. That's why Timothy says, knowing this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. And it describes all those things that are going to go in. And it says in the end of it, in verse 4, it says, they shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. That's why the Bible says in the next chapter, preach the word, be instant, in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Do you ever notice that those verses are all part of the perilous times? Do you know what he said to churches and Christians and people alike? Do you know what he said in the midst of that? Give them what is true when it's popular and when it's not. In season and out of season. I'm not saying all this for us to be like, oh man. Well, I am saying that to say (laughs) it should wake us up. I want us to view our world around us like what it is and not like, well, we're not the great falling away. We're not like that. Then you know what happens if you don't view yourself like that? We give heed to seducing spirits because we're passive. I want to be aggressive. I want to work forward. I want to stand up. I want to preach. I want to teach. I want to hit things dead on. But let me tell you at the same time, I want to speak the truth in love. It's not helping to leave out the love of God and only beat people over the head with doctrine. And don't get me wrong, we should be preaching doctrine. But at the same time, we also have truth that should be delivered through hearts that love people. And doing that simultaneously, the Bible talks about speaking the truth in love. But I believe as we get to near this time that the darker the night, it only means that the brighter the light gets. The more that there's an absence of what marriage should be, your marriage should shine in your community like like a city set on a hill, if I'm going to be biblical about it. Your kids, if they're living right, should be able to live in their school and stand out differently. And I'm not walking through with the family Bible. I'm just talking about respecting and loving and caring and speaking up and and just the love of God and let your light so shine before men. So, close how we started. The illustration of Lot, illustration of Noah. 
something happened in that story with Lot that's weird. It's weird. Can we just admit some, some things in the Bible are weird? I know we don't like to do that. It's just like, that's weird. You know, I mean, a talking donkey is weird, okay? It's just weird. There's stuff that doesn't add up to us and things like that. It's just, but it's neat because it's the mysterious ways of God working. Our great God is not limited by anything. So God gives us a glimpse into the conversation that he had with, with Abraham before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And God said, I want that in the word of God. And he gave us this. So Abraham is talking with God. And God said, I'm going to destroy that city. And a righteous man, that is Abraham, begins to con- converse with God. And Abraham drew near and said, will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? He's asking God, he said, wait a minute, I know you, God. I mean, I, I, God, I know your character. You're not going to go in there and just destroy those that are following you and doing right. You're not going to just destroy them like it's nothing. No, God doesn't do that. Peradventure, there be 50 righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein? And he starts having this conversation with God. And he says, if, if there's 50 people in there, God, would you spare America? Would you spare the world if you can find this many? And God said, yeah, if you can find that many. Because that means that there's that many that are doing and accomplishing the mission and the purpose of God. Bringing glory to God, raising people, multiplying Christians, raising families to do right, speaking truth, those things that we've been called according to his purpose. There's not 50. Lord, if there's 10, no, if there's 40, if there's 30, if there's 20, if there's 10, God said if there's 10, I won't destroy it. Now remember, this is our illustration of this. Why has God not returned all this time during the time of D.L. Moody, during the time of Billy Sunday, during the time even of Billy Graham? During the, you know what I'm saying? It's, and God says, I'm just looking for that. And I think we get to the place that there's just a handful left. And God says, it's time to call them home. And I say the reason why we see this great falling away and the reason why I talk about the church statistics and I talk about, you know, even in our society today that people would say, I'd rather go to church once a month or at random than I would there. That that is a heart thing, that there is no longer a desire for the things of God. We're seeing this happening and God is just showing his heart saying, I'm not just going to come and just leave people high. I don't want the tribulation period to start because I just want to torture people. I'm just saying when there's nobody left serving God and that crowd gets so small, I'm going to call it done. 